So our next speaker is Maria Molfino. She's a writer and women's creative leadership coach with a master's in design from Stanford. She has helped a range of women lead from creative professionals at Facebook, Airbnb, Twitter, and IDEO to women looking to leave the sex trade in India. She also created Women in Design, a series of intimate SF-based events that share the stories of top women leaders in design and tech, which inspired the recent launch of a really wonderful podcast that she hosts called Heroin. Welcome, Maria. Once upon a time, there was a man who shared an anecdote from his childhood. He said, when I went to school, they asked me what I wanted to be when I grow up. And I said, happy. My teacher said, you don't understand the assignment. And I said, you don't understand life. This was John Lennon, one of the greatest creative geniuses of our time, and also a really creative kid. The truth is, schools really discourage creative thinking. When you think about it, the way the school system is currently designed, it doesn't encourage creative confidence in children. We tell them, just in the way that we test, that there's a right answer and that there's a wrong answer. Ken Robinson, in one of his TED Talks, shared something exactly about this. He said, kids will take a chance. They're not afraid of being wrong. And by the time they get to be adults, most kids have lost that capacity. They've become frightened of being wrong. And we run our companies like this. We stigmatize mistakes. The result is we educate people out of their creative capabilities. I agree with Ken Robinson. And I would also add a layer to his argument, which is that there are certain demographic groups that are really at risk for having their creative confidence be deflated. One such group is women, girls and women. So I wrote this article for Fast Code Design, asking why aren't there more women in design leading in tech? And of course, we know that there are systemic and cultural factors that make the path very difficult uh, to leadership for women. But I'd like to also argue that it starts earlier than that. It starts when women are young, when they're little girls, and how we socialize girls and boys differently. Across the globe, girls outperform boys in school. They're better students. They get higher grades. But when you look at why, it's not because there's a difference in intelligence. It's actually because they are more self-disciplined. They have higher, what you call, self-regulation, which means they hand their homework in on time, they wait their turn to speak, they follow the rules, and teachers love girls. They love them. Um, now, if you want to innovate and lead and be an entrepreneur and a designer and disrupt industries, it's not really a great, you know, tendency to develop. It works in school, though. So when we look at why this is happening, we realize, well, it's happening because of the way that we treat boys and girls. It turns out um, there's landmark research by Carol Dweck. She's a professor at Stanford. We praise little boys for effort and hard work, and we're more likely to praise girls for fixed traits like intelligence. And what this creates is a different type of mindset. We know that when you praise children for uh, effort, they develop a growth mindset, which is the belief that you can change, that you can actually, if you persist, you can change. When you praise for traits, you develop a fixed mindset which is the belief that you can't change no matter how hard you work. And when you look and follow children throughout the ages, you find that this happens. Girls are less likely to persist at hard tasks because they have developed fixed mindsets because of the way they've been praised by teachers and parents. Another really interesting uh, body of research is this idea of loss of voice. And maybe you've noticed this. When you talk to a 10, 11-year-old girl, she's pretty outspoken. She's rambunctious, she tells you how she feels. What about 13, 14 years old? They get quiet. They get more quiet, more reserved, less likely to express and share their opinions. This has been validated by research at Harvard that literally we see girls lose their voices throughout middle school. Literally lose their voice. 
the way school is designed right now, it's pretty traditional. It's based on the Industrial Revolution. And so I'm just going to go over a few things, shifts that we need to make to have more progressive, alternative forms of education. The first is there's a big emphasis on math and verbal. And we know now that humans have many type of intelligences. As designers, kinesthetic intelligence, for example, is so important, right? Your relationship to an object, your relationship to software, your body and space. And that's actually being under... Um, it's not represented in curriculum. I know when I went to school, everything was siloed, right? You had physics, biology, then you had English class, history, and the real world isn't like that. So project-focused uh, uh, education where we're solving problems, but we're drawing on multiple disciplines, and that also creates more, it's creative, right? When we draw from poetry and biology and different disciplines to solve a problem. It's kind of like what we do in design sprints. The other thing, like I said in the beginning of my talk, how we test children and how we test is a big deal. How are we assessing learning? It turns out we test a lot what you know. Do you know content? Like, are you, do you, have you memorized? And what's really important is to test how you use what you know, which is what designers do and entrepreneurs do. Imagine a world where students can come to teachers and say, hey, I'm really fascinated by this. I'm really interested in this. Can you support me? So student-directed learning. And finally, uh, we got a shift from just school-only context to actually getting out into the real world. So what's an example of this kind of education? Well, <laughs> design thinking, right? So when we look at design thinking, it literally hits all those factors. It's all intelligences, it's project focused, it'll test how, you, you know, test how you use what you know through iteration and feedback. So design thinking is an example of this kind of progressive form of education. Here are the three questions I want to leave you with. We're designing the future. What kind of future are we designing? Who is defining the future we're designing? Who is designing that future? Who, who? To think about that more deeply. Doing the right thing, not the easy thing. Diversity is hard, it's prickly, it's uncomfortable, it takes time, it takes effort. It's not the easy thing, but it's the right thing. It's the right thing to do. And as we have more diverse representation on design teams, we're gonna solve problems in a better way. Diversity has already been shown to, to lead to better financial outcomes and more innovation. So I want to challenge each of you, if you are at a startup or if you're starting one, to look around and if everyone looks like you, then you have a problem. And do one thing. What's the one thing you can do to increase diversity on your team? That's my challenge to you. When you look at nature and ecology, the most sustainable systems are biodiverse. So it makes sense, our creative communities shouldn't be different, right? Um, and I believe, I truly believe that this starts with empowering marginalized groups, women, demographics at risk. From the very beginning, we need to stoke their creative confidence, not deflate it. I believe in a world where we all can co-create and design the future together. Thank you. <laughs>